Oh, it's 1030, so I'm going to get started. Welcome everyone to this session um, called Introduction to Rubin, where we're going to go over all the systems and the jargon and the acronyms um, that will help you sort of get oriented for the week ahead, especially if you are new to Rubin. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, go over some of the friendly reminders. The first one of which is that we do have a code of conduct. And if you do witness or experience any forms of bullying, harassment, or aggression, um, you can find the code of conduct in the PCW website. And when you go to it, you'll find instructions on who to contact um, to, to help you and to report the, um, uh, what you have experienced. So that is there for you. Other reminders are that all the talks in this workshop are recorded unless um, otherwise requested. Um, all the videos will be posted the next day. Um, as we go, we'll be taking questions either through the Zoom chat or via the Slack channel for this session. Um, so you can post your questions in either place. And on the Slack channel, if someone posts a question that you have the same question or you really like that question, give it a little emoji or something. And that helps our, our Slack monitors to prioritize the questions um, as we go. So you have those opportunities open to you as well. Um, today's session is going to be very fast and furious. A lot of information coming at you uh, really quick um, by design. We wanted to really sort of just sort of open it up and um, get you all this. These slides are available on the session webpage uh, for you to use as a resource afterwards or during. Um, so go ahead, you can go to the session webpage, like in the PCW webpage, and grab these slides if you want. Uh, we're going to start by covering some of the communication methods and then go over what happens during the project and community workshop and how our virtual one is a bit different from our in-person one. Now we're going to cover all of the major Rubin Observatory systems um, and all the jargon that, uh, that they use to get you oriented. And then finally we'll end with an overview of the science collaboration. So we're really sort of touching on the surface of a lot of different aspects of Rubin Observatory. We're going to have a lot of different speakers today as well. Um, and oh, I'm Melissa Graham and I work for Rubin Observatory at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, I'll be your co-chair today along with Jim Annis. You'll see Jim especially in the Slack and he's waving at you there um, to get your questions answered as we go. And we have a lot of other speakers that represent a broad range of um, Rubin Observatory departments to speak to you today as well. And in that, let's get started. First up is communications and Rand Paul. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, you probably heard from me earlier and you've been bombarded by emails from me, but I'm Rampal Gill, Head of Communications for Rubin Observatory for the Constru Construction Project. And if you were at the plenary, then you would have heard that our name changed around December 2019. So this is really just giving you a quick overview of the various names that we do have. So now we are officially the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. We don't we put the word the in front. We try to avoid using the word the in front. Um, the survey is called Legacy Survey of Space and Time. So we got to still continue using LSST, which was a great win for us with the name change. And the telescope is called the Simone Survey Telescope, which fulfills our promise to Simone, who gave the project $20 million in the early days when we were first getting set up and started. Um, we don't use the acronym VRO. I'm not sure if that's on the next slide, but uh, we don't use the acronym VRO because, like I said, we're named after Vera Rubin, and we want to use the name as much as possible. We want to mention it as much as possible um, to highlight and to amplify her name, and we feel that VRO just doesn't achieve that for us. Um, shortening to Rubin is fine, though. Um, so it's actually quicker to say Rubin than it is to say VRO. So hopefully that uh, will encourage people to use that. Um, and we can always be contacted for clarification on how to use the name. If you're writing an article or a paper or something, please don't hesitate to reach out. Even if you've looked at the name guideline and you're thinking, hey, I still don't, I still don't really get it. Just get in touch with us and we'll help you out. So I think the next slide, um, is not unusual, I guess, when you do join a new project or a community to be hit with new vocabulary and abbreviations, et cetera. But we do have this really good glossary that you can access um, the, to get to, to, you just type in a few letters and it will give you back what it has in the database. Um, so please check it out. And if you find something's not in there, then let us know. There's also a link in the slides. It's 
it's gone into our template with acronyms and glossary that, so that you can always click on that and um, figure out what something is uh, if it's being presented to you in the abbreviated form. So on the next slide, the, um, the main website is the lsst.org website. It still is. Um, it will be updated for operations, but for now, for at least for the duration of the construction project, this URL will continue working. And the links that I've tried to point to show you a wealth of information for the community. And we do try to keep it as up to date as often as possible. And we don't always succeed in that. But if you um, go there and you know that something is badly out of date, please let us know. But otherwise, we're hoping that you can go there and get a wealth of information and uh, help you out with, with what you're trying to find. On the next slide, you'll see that we use a number of channels to get information out. And here are all of our social media channels. Uh, I'll call out three channels in particular. Uh, one, you can always email the communications team. You will get an answer from us if we don't know who can help you, we can put you in touch. Um, if you don't know who can help you, we can put you in touch with anyone because we know everyone across the project. You can subscribe to our digest, which goes out approximately every two weeks and has a very good summary of information of what's happened or what's coming up. And then you can usually click through to get some more information. And finally, there's the community forum, which has been updated recently. It's a lot more user-friendly. Um, has great links to various information and is getting more and more use and uh, is very busy with a lot of information uh, that is relevant to various people across the project and the community. I'll just end by letting you know that the communications team is made up of four people and we work together on a multitude of projects and so an example putting this uh, PCW together but we also work on other things like media inquiries and, and we're always happy to help. So like I said, if you need an answer to something, you don't know how to navigate the ecosystem, which is the Rubin Observatory, just write to communications team and we'll help you out. Thank you. Thank you, Rand Paul. Um, with this next slide, I just wanted to highlight various aspects of the annual project and community workshop or PCW. Uh, one aspect that's unique about the PCW is that many of the breakout sessions that you will attend this week cover topics that were suggested by the science community, and many of those are also organized and run by community members, not by project staff. All of the sessions are open to all attendees except the anti-racism workshop, um, which has limited space. That's the one that's on Thursday and Friday, but all other sessions are open to everyone. This year's virtual PCW features two plenaries given by Rubin Project Leadership on Monday. So the last session was the first one, so you were probably just in. And then there's another one on Tuesday. Uh, we have open diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, sessions on Monday and Wednesday. Um, a session of contributed flash talks held in lieu of a poster session will be on Tuesday after the plenary. There are Spanish language sessions on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday a science keynote plenary on Thursday, a few fun social oriented sessions like the lightning stories and virtual board games, board games is on Wednesday. And the very last session on Friday is like an omnibus of single slide summaries from all of the sessions. So you can get a little summary of everything that you missed um, by attending the very last session on Friday. When we meet in person, the PCW typically features um, more technical sessions for project staff, embedded parallel workshops, a student poster session, an unconference session to discuss emergent topics and to uh, work collaboratively. And also we usually have more social events and also a public talk when we meet in person. And so that's just if you're new to the PCW to give you sort of a highlight reel of what's happening now and what usually happens when we're in person. And now I just want to pause really briefly just for any questions about communications or what is happening this week at the PCW. I'll give you a second to write in the Slack or in the Zoom. <clears throat> or you could, I guess you could raise your hand as well. Um, I might see you. I don't see any hands raised. There's no questions in Slack. Okay. Or oh, somebody's typing one though. Oh, we better wait. <laughs> Uh, 
has discourse totally replaced mailing lists? Oh, not yet. So often when there's something to advertise, um, I will post it in community. Um, it's very easy to set yourself up to receive notifications so you can get emailed when stuff goes up in community. But typically I still, um, we still send things to the science mailing list and to the science collaborations mailing list um, for like really like big opportunities, things that we really want to advertise events and stuff like that. So no, it hasn't completely replaced all email yet, um, but it is, community is much more valuable um, than, than email lists. Okay, let's keep on going with um, our systems overview. First step, I believe, Sandrine, you first up. Thank you. Can you hear me fine? Okay, great. Uh, so yes, my name is Sandrine Thomas. I'm the telescope and science scientist. And uh, here is what our subsystem is composed of and what it's supposed to be uh, doing. So we are responsible for acquiring, calibrating, and scheduling the survey. And as a result, we are responsible for the list of elements that I put on the left. So we have a structure both located at the summit, uh, which is most of the time the one that we're uh, highlighting, but also we had to uh, redo the base facility. So the one located in La Serena, and you see a little tiny picture, if Melissa can point it out on in, the, in the picture. Uh, so we had to increase the number of offices to accommodate for all the staff that is required by Ruben. Uh, we also, uh, at the summit, have two telescopes. Uh, the main telescope, which is on the left on the picture on the bottom, and also the uh, calibration telescope, Oxtel, uh, that Victor mentioned in the plenary. Uh, inside the main telescope, uh, you will hear a lot about the TMA, which is a telescope mount assembly, and that's really the whole structure that we hold the mirror. And that structure is very compact and stiff to be able to um, move very quickly and uh, accommodate for the high cadence of the survey, which as a reminder is observing a uh, field every about 39 seconds. So it's very quick. Uh, we have a dome with a light screen and because of that very high cadence, it needs to follow the TMA. So that's why we're saying that the dome is crawling to follow the TMA around and get in place for the next observation. The two mirrors that we have are M1, M3 and M2 and I will go over in the next slide so I won't too much time and we also have a camera exapod, M2 exapod and a rotator to follow the sky. Uh, we're also responsible for all the control software for all those elements and a few acronyms are listed here that you will hear along this, um, this meeting. The SAL is our service abstraction layer, it's really our communication channel, so it's how you send uh, commands and receive telemetry. We have a engineering facility database to store all the communication um, that is happening and some of the events that are happening as we are taking images. And they can be, again, engineering. So like it's it, if the dome is sending some command or some event that you're gonna get that and you're gonna get that stored in that uh, EFD. All the components are controlled by what we call CSCs and those CSCs are uh, controllable sa controller cell components and they are really uh, the intermediate between the high level uh, software, your telescope control system, and also all the uh, low level motors and such. And finally, the scheduler is our brain. It's the brain of the observatory and it will take uh, all sorts of inputs such as the state of the survey, the um, weather, uh, clouds, the seeing, and then decide which filter to use and where to go in the sky to optimize the survey over the 10 years. And again, we have that calibration system, which has two components, the in-dome calibration and arc style. Another big element of our observatory is the coding plant. Uh, I say coding plant because it has a huge coding chamber. You will see in the next picture and then a washing station. And if you're interested at all in some of the more technical aspect of uh, telescope inside and what's going on in the observatory, please attend the Spanish talks that are from Tuesday to Thursday from noon to 1 p.m. PST. Next slide, please. 
All right, so I'll go very briefly because I don't have much time, but uh, as I mentioned, we have a three mirror optical design, which accommodate a 3.5 degree field of view. And you see a couple of picture, if you can point Melissa in the middle, uh, you have the M1, the M1, M3 at the bottom. Uh, you're gonna hear about M1, M3 because the M1 and the M3 mirrors are inside a uh, same monolith uh, substrate. So it makes it easier to align. <laughs> we had to align once and then uh, since then it's, it's aligned. And then at the top you have uh, the M2, our secondary, which is actually pretty big, it's 3.4 meter. And the whole system is very fast. So you're gonna hear a lot about how fast it is and how compact it is because it's F1. So that means the beam converge very quickly. And we also have a laser tracker for alignment. The whole thing is uh, controlled to get a really optimum uh, uh, image quality by an active optic system, which has both a lookup table, which is an open model that will uh, move the actuators underneath those mirrors to get the best surface possible. And also um, wavefront sensors at the corner of the camera, the LSSD camera to allow for, uh, for feedback on residuals that you might have. And the picture on the right, uh, the top is M2 coded because again, another thing that is important for this survey is the throughput. And part of the throughput is achieved by a very good coding on the mirrors. And that's why we have in the back, you'll see a little bit the, the coding chamber in the back of the mirror. And then Steve is gonna talk about um, more detail about the, the throughput of the camera. And I already mentioned uh, the two um, calibration system that we have, the in-dome calibration, which are uh, calibration screen uh, and the collimated, collimated beam projector, CBP. Uh, you can ask me uh, if you want to know more about the second one and then Oxtel for to measure the ast astromatic transmission. Next slide. So very briefly, um, this is not a technically telescope in sight, but as we're moving ahead, all subsystems are merging into uh, sitcom that Victor presented, the system integration and commissioning. And uh, I wanted to show this because uh, a lot of the time we talk about this level three software integration, and this is really to uh, look at all the systems that are located on what we call the level three, which is the maintenance level. And you see uh, the picture on the left on the bottom. And we have uh, most of the components that will be put on a TMA uh, when the TMA is uh, done. And we're trying to do a lot of communication uh, tests between all those components to get ahead. The other um, part that I wanted to mention here is ComCam, uh, and you've heard about it from Victor. ComCam is a commissioning camera. It's a smaller version of the LSST cam. It has a lot of similarity with the main camera but it's only one raft, which is nine CCDs. And we're using that at first to understand um, and to test a lot of the, uh, the pipeline as well. Uh, and then uh, I think that's pretty much it. You can read through the uh, rest of what SITCOM will do. And also there's a lot of uh, related talk, one happening right now uh, at the same time, and then a couple more tomorrow, uh, today and tomorrow. And I think I'm done. Thank you. OK, shall I continue, Melissa? Yes. So I'm Steve Ritz. I'm the camera project scientist. Uh, very happy to be here with you. Happy that you are here and looking forward to continuing uh, interacting with you. Um, first thing to tell you about the camera is unlike uh, other observatories, possibly where there's a telescope and then instruments that are put on the telescope, from the beginning, this observatory was an integrated single system. Now we do have subsystems because we have to build stuff, um, but uh, we work hard to try to avoid siloing and um, we try to uh, have uh, excellent communication because um, the uh, control of systematics is so important for the science that uh, we all wanna do. So when you hear camera and the data from the camera, um, you can't see my cursor, I just realized. But if you look at the Science Raft Tower, uh, one of those towers is in ComCam. That's uh, here just a little further up. Sorry, I was imagining uh, 
up here uh, just next to the camera above the chain. Yeah, so um, if you see cryostat, then there's a call out to the cryostat. And uh, the sensors are in the cryostat on these rafts uh, where the rafts um, uh, are an array, a three by three array of these sensors. And um, that's kind of the heart of the camera. Uh, there are 189 of these 4K by 4K CCBs and they're segmented into 16 parallel readout chains, sometimes called segments or amplifiers. And so that means that this is basically 3000 uh, pretty great uh, one megapixel astronomical cameras all read out together. Um, just to give you a sense to have, to view one image at full resolution uh, would take about 384 KTVs. And so there are 21 of those science rafts uh, plus the four corner rafts appropriately named because they're in the corner of the focal plane where uh, there are among other things, the uh, wavefront sensors that connect with, give information to uh, the telescope and sight system as you heard from Sandrine. But there's so much more to the camera as you saw in Sandrine's slides, there are three refractive optics, three lenses, uh, at the very front here on the lower left, you see the L1, L2 assembly. That's about a over a five foot diameter uh, entry lens. And uh, then uh, light continues on through um, past a filter, uh, which is a pretty big object. And there are five filters on board that can be changed at any time in about uh, two minutes. And uh, there's a sixth filter that's off board that's changed during the day. So there are six uh, filters covering the full optical, really kind of UV to near infrared spectrum and uh, shutter. And uh, there's an entry window to the cryostat, which is in vacuum, and that's the third lens. All of those optics also have excellent anti-reflective coatings for uh, great uh, throughput. Each one of the pixels, uh, the plate scale is 0.2 arc seconds on a side. They're physically 10 microns um, feature size, 10 microns by 10 microns wide, 100 microns thick or deep to have good uh, efficiency for collecting the longest wavelength light. And as you heard, that is there, those three gigapixels for the camera are there to image this 10 square degree field of view um, uh, at a uh, resolution commensurate with how well the light pool from a point far away focuses onto the focal plane. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention at the bottom in yellow, I added our overview paper, which isn't just the camera. It's all the stuff you're hearing about here. And since I made this slide, I it may be good to put up at the very front, but uh, this is a great place to look to see why it is the whole observatory has the design it does, what were the trades, what are the particularly great features it has that connect to the science. So I recommend that paper very highly. Next slide, and I'll accelerate. All of these different pieces are actually already built, um, and they are sitting uh, at Slack being integrated together. Slack is... Um, a particle physics and uh, basic energy sciences laboratory operated by the DOE at Stanford. And it's a great place for integrating hardware. In fact, the camera is a project that is led and uh, managed from uh, Slack. And you see pictures of each of the pieces that are there. Um, the really, each one of these things is really impressive, it was really hard to make. And um, is the work of hundreds of people over much more than a decade. A very cool thing on the right in the middle is the gigapixel focal plane that's complete, that's uh, sitting there. We're very, very happy about that. That all got integrated before, the, just before the pandemic uh, hit. Uh, there are two types of sensors. Each raft is of a, only one type of sensor, um, but there are 13 of the 21 rafts are from one sensors from one vendor, E2V, and the other eight are from a different vendor, ITL. They have slightly different quantum efficiency curves, but, um, uh, but overall their sensitivity is uh, pretty similar. 
Um, the ITL sensors are slightly noisier, um, but the E2V uh, sensors have their own intriguing characteristics. Uh, great news is we just got our sixth and final filter, the hardest one to make, the U-band filter. You saw a picture in Victor's slides on the lower left. You see the transmission curves from all six filters. They exist, they're verified. The as-built performance characteristics related to throughput are included in the Rubin system engineering uh, repository. Um, and we're just really happy all this stuff uh, is here. There've been a lot of challenges. You heard the refrigeration system, particularly the cold system that keeps the electronics cold. Uh, has been a continuing challenge. Um, just working during the pandemic has been really hard and it's amazing actually how much progress has continues to be made. Next slide. Last slide. So look ahead. Um, you heard the word electro-optical testing earlier. That is where we throw light at the focal plane um, and uh, look very carefully at the instrument signatures and characteristics uh, that need to uh, that could possibly have a an impact on science and where we optimize the readout. Um, that sh that'll take about six more weeks. It was interrupted again um, by uh, COVID. And um, that should be happening uh, several weeks from now. And then uh, the price that will be uh, the, the entry window that's flat that's on now will be replaced by the actual L3 lens by uh, November. Um, we then integrate the cryostat with the camera body and that big L1, L2 lens, uh, complete by February. Then there's a lot of functional testing to do and some end-to-end -end verification to do. And then uh, next July would be the final pre-ship verification. Camera flies to Chile, uh, gets re-verified, um, and uh, is ready for telescope integration uh, early in uh, 23. One thing I'll just say with all that testing that we're doing to the extent we can, uh, we are using the Rubin Science Platform and the DM software you're about to hear about to the extent possible to analyze the camera test data, again, in collaboration with our colleagues in DM. And that's it. Looking forward to your questions. Thanks, Stevie. We're going to pause for questions in a little bit. Um, yep. First, we move on to DM. Um, so this is a single slide overview of the entire data management system, or DMS. The raw images are processed by two pipelines on two time scales. The prompt pipeline does the nightly processing, releasing information about changing and moving objects on two time scales, 60 seconds for alerts, and 24 hours for updated catalogs and image databases. The data release pipeline produces static sky catalogs and deep image coads on an annual basis. The alerts, the 60 seconds alerts, will be accessed via community brokers, and all the other data products will be accessed via the Rubin Science Platform, or RSP, which is software infrastructure deployed at the Rubin Data Access Centers, or DACs, or DACs. The RSP will provide compute resources for next to the data analysis, and a full description of the future LSST data products can be found in the DPDD, which is the Data Products Definitions document. Let's go into more detail about the data products of the LSST science pipelines. Starting in the left panel, the prompt pipeline performs difference image analysis, or DIA. The sources detected in individual difference images are called DIA sources, and the collection of DIA sources at a given sky location is a DIA object. An alert is an ASCII file of data for a given DIA source, and they are transmitted to brokers for um, science analyses. DIA sources that are for moving objects, not static variables and transients, are linked together as solar system objects or SS objects. The catalogs of DIA sources and DIA objects are collectively referred to as the Prompt Products Database or the PPDB. In the center panel, we have the annual data releases, which start with DR1 um, at the first half year, and then DR2 at the first year, and then annually thereafter to DR11. However, note that might change soon in the near future so that DR1 is year one and so on. So watch out for that change maybe coming. A standard visit refers to a 30 second image in a given filter. And the term CALEX refers to a single CCD of a processed visit image or a PVI. And the term COAD refers to a deep stack of visits. 
the All Sky co added image produced by the data release pipeline is divided into tracks, which are divided into patches, where a single patch is about the same size as a calyx. The data release pipeline produces three main catalogs. The source catalog has detections in all single images. Objects are the collections of sources at a given sky location. And the force source catalog contains force photometry from single images at the locations of all the sources ever detected in any image or any coad. In the right panel, we introduce the term user-generated data products, which refers to the results of any processing or reprocessing done by the science community. This might include, for example, images stacked with novel algorithms or value-added catalog data products. As Rubin transitions from construction to operations, all systems undergo a commissioning phase and data previews are an integral part of commissioning the data management system. The first called data preview zero or DP zero has already begun with the release of simulated LSST like data in an early version of the Rubin science platform, but just to a small cohort of users for now. Data previews one and two will happen in the coming years and we'll use real data from Rubin observatory. I'm going to pass it over to Lauren to tell you a little bit about EPO. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Um, my name is Lauren Corlys. I'm the EPO scientist. Um, and I like to think of EPO as the way that uh, observatory is interfacing with everyone who isn't a scientist. Um, so the general public, um, science centers, citizen science uh, projects that people might want to do, educators, these are all the audiences that we're serving. Um, and so I've put here our mission statement because I feel like that really summarizes what we're trying to do as EPO, which is to provide online data driven experiences that are accessible and approachable, adding real world context and opportunities for people to engage with Rubin Observatory and explore the universe. So how are we bringing the observatory to everyone else? Um, so our program includes things like interactive data experiences in the browser, um, the website for operations that will go live, uh, and all sky viewer that we are calling the sky viewer classroom activities, uh, citizen science infrastructure, and communications and social media strategies. Um, and as Victor mentioned earlier this morning, EPO is entering operations in October, 2022. Next slide, please. Um, so this was a brief overview. Um, we're hosting our own EPO overview session if you'd like to hear more about what we've been up to. Um, and we're also hosting a session later this week specifically about our citizen science efforts that we've been leading. So definitely check those out if those topics are interesting to you. Uh, and on the right, if you can't make it to the EPO overview session, I put a link to a demo of a bunch of the different kinds of interactive data experiences that we've been building. So you can check those out in your own time. Um, and if you're busy at the PCW, but are still interested in EPO, um, we have a Slack channel in the normal Rubin Slack that's just EPO. So come and join us and we post things there periodically. Um, we also have a survey live to try and understand um, what the community might want, the community of scientists who are interested in outreach, how they might want to participate and what we could produce that would be helpful to you all. Uh, and then finally, I just want to add that we're hiring a senior front end web developer. So if you know anyone who has those kinds of skills and is interested in astronomy, uh, please encourage them to apply and join our, join our team. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. One, one more topic before we break for questions. Um, so, and this one is a little bit about survey strategy. So the core Rubin and LSST science requirements are described in the science requirements document or at the SRD, which is available at ls.st backslash SRD. Um, the baseline survey strategy was designed to meet these core science requirements. And an illustration of the baseline survey strategy is shown here as a map of the sky with regions color, um, colored by the number of visits received over 10 years. The wide, fast, deep survey of extragalactic regions, um, a total of 18,000 square degrees, would receive about 800 visits in total over all filters um, in 10 years at a given location. Within the wide, fast, deep region, there is also a requirement that all fields observed in a given night must be revisited in that same night to enable the discovery of moving objects. The baseline survey strategy includes additional areas as shown in the sky map, at least four deep drilling fields, the North Ecliptic Spur, the Galactic Plain, and the South Celestial Pole. The baseline survey is a fiducial survey which will achieve the core science requirements, but there remain many open questions about how to optimize the strategy to maximize the scientific return of the LSST. To help the science community address these open questions, 
The Rubin Observatory LSSD scheduler team is generating a wide variety of simulated surveys. These are called operation simulations or OPSIM runs for short. Each OPSIM run takes as input strategy parameters such as area, revisit frequency, and things like that, generates 10 years of site data such as weather, and then schedules full 10 years of observations. The result of that is an OPSIM database of simulated observational metadata. To help scientists evaluate these OPSIM runs, the LSSC scheduler team has built the Metric Analysis Framework, or MAF, a code package that enables the derivation of scientific results from an OPSIM database. An individual metric is a measure of scientific performance, such as the number of detections of a type of object or the 10-year co-added depth in an extragalactic field. The um, LSST scheduler team has so far generated about 200 different OPSIM runs, and the science community is actively designing metrics to represent a wide variety of LSST science goals and engaging in comparative analyses of the various survey strategies. If you're interested in this kind of thing, I'll point out that there are three sessions on survey strategies during the PCW. Two are on Wednesday and one is on Thursday. So from here, after that fast and furious onslaught of information, we'll pause for your questions about um, all the systems, the jargon. Uh, I'm sure lots of it uh, was, was new to you. So we'll just pause for a moment and take some questions either, either via Zoom or from the Slack. Perhaps your minds are thoroughly boggled and <laughs> you have questions about everything. Um, we'll just like, we'll just wait another minute. And I can't see the Slack. So if, if there's no, there questions. Is. There yeah. is. Great. Sorry, Jim, did you? Okay, I'll go ahead. Um, are there sources of background for Rubin that are common to all different analyses? Interesting. So is the background, I mean, like sky background in the images? Is that a question for Steve, maybe? Do you mean sky noise or do you mean um, something else? If you could just help us out a little bit. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Welcome. Sorry, I was going to say, Chris, please feel free to unmute and uh, ask your yeah, question. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, th that's what I, um, things that are, are not signal. I, I'm not in astronomy, so... Uh, until until recently, so that's why I'm wondering. Well, let's see. For sky noise or sky background, they're real photons, and we love all photons. Um, so, um, so I wouldn't call those. Those are not. It depends on the science you're interested in, um, and those are band dependent, or that level is band dependent, with the U band having the lowest um, sky noise background. Um, uh, there are, yeah, I don't, uh, maybe the other aspect that might interest you, I'm not sure, is that there are secondaries, secondary particles from high energy cosmic ray air showers that will go through the silicon and deposit energy. And I think we're pretty good at identifying those and removing those. Those are the two aspects I can think of for your question, but maybe others have some, some uh, other thoughts. Jim? So at, from an astronomy point of view, there's the sky, which is bright, and there are stars and galaxies which are brighter than sky. But most of the things I'm interested in are fainter than the sky, so you have to remove the sky. Then you start reaching galactic dust, which can be both absorbent and emissive, it's bright enough to see, you have to worry about them. The wings of stars are bright enough to disturb faint galaxies near stars. It's a real rat's nest or scientific research project, understand, and I'll point you at the low surface brightness session later today, and really see what people are doing on that. If I could just add by wings, I think you mean the tails of the point spread function, which means where the how the light from a point source far away actually falls onto the focal plane itself. 
Wow, awesome, thanks. So yeah, the point out to the low surface brightness session is probably very relevant um, here. So thanks for making that connection. Um, at this point, we're gonna, we're gonna move on and we're gonna have uh, Fed tell you all about the LSSD science collaborations. You ready? Yes, I am. I've loved hearing the doggos in the background of all the speakers. I'm kind of hoping that my dog chimes in now. <laughs> So hello, my name is Federica Bianco. I am the science collaborations coordinator, Rubin, and the co-chair of one of the eight science collaborations, the Transcendence and Variable Star Science Collaborations. Otherwise, I'm at the University of Delaware. Um, I'm the science collaborations. One thing that you have not heard yet uh, throughout all the talks that you've heard so far is um, anything about a science theme of Rubin. So if you're accustomed to prior synoptic surveys and large surveys, you probably think of maybe SDSS. And you know that in addition to all the people that work on the survey, there are people that are tasked with producing science from the photons. Rubin works a little bit differently. Um, the extent of the, invest the national investments of the NSF and DOE cover the survey design, the survey construction, um, the production of data, the distribution of data and data products. But the community is really tasked with the responsibility and the challenge and the honor to turn those data and data products into science. So the community has self-organized several years back into eight science collaborations. And next slide. I wasn't actually remembering to ask to switch slides. And so one peculiar aspect of the survey is that unlike most surveys, Rubin really is designed to do everything that can be done with a really exciting, broad, deep, excellent quality series of images of the sky that extend over 10 years, from near Earth objects all the way to the most, top, most distant cosmological objects. So there is no um, specific science focus for the survey, although you've heard about the four science pillars that, that, um, that are solar system, transcendence and variable sky, um, studying the Milky Way, and studying dark energy and dark matter, really Rubin LSSD is designed to do all exciting science that can come from an amazing data set. So next slide. So here is kind of where the science collaborations um, come into play. There are eight teams. They were, they're self-organized, self-managed teams there as of just a couple of days ago, um, the eight existing science collaborations are officially recognized uh, by Rubin, and we have established a process to recognize the existing and potentially future science collaborations. These groups are divided by science expertise and science interests into active galactic nuclei, dark energy, transient and variable star science collaborations, stars Milky Way, local volume science collaboration, strong lensing science collaboration, galaxy science collaboration and solar system science collaboration. And last but not least, slightly different because it's a methodological group rather than domain focus group, informatic and statistics science collaborations. Next slide, please. The science collaboration um, include over 1,500 members. I think maybe now closer to 2,000. Uh, they have members um, across six continents. Over 20 countries are represented. Um, next slide, please. And so the science collaboration uh, are essentially collaborative where we prepare for LSSD. That means we make sure that the background science and observations are in place so that we can make the best out of the LSSD survey. Uh, we provide expert advice and analysis to Rubin as needed as we're called on to do that based on our, um, on our experience and expertise. We train, we educate, we engage the scientific community inside of the science collaboration. We fundraise for our own team and for our own projects. We develop and implement research inclusion practices. We had a recent shift of our focus towards inclusions. I'll mention a couple of things in a second about that. And uh, we also collaborate on software development uh, to turn the LSST data into science. And this includes working with the in-kind contribution teams that have proposed um, in-kind contribution um, to acquire data rights to Rubin. Essentially, um, it, the members of the science collaboration enjoy a supportive and collaborative environment to get ready for Rubin and figure out what we can do with the amazing Rubin data set. Next slide. 
I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of things that we do. We have, we very often have groups, groups of, uh, sorry, meetings, meetings of the individual science collaborations. We had meetings um, across um, the United States and uh, we had several meetings in Europe as well in most recent years. Um, these meetings, of course, have been mostly remotely in the last couple of years. So I'm using pictures that are slightly old now to show you the actual in-person meeting back when those things were possible. We also have meetings of joint science collaborations. We recently organized the uh, Rubin LSST metric hackathon that was for all science collaborations, for example. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to highlight a couple of programs. There is a DP0 New Friends program that the science club. Oh, I had a cute icon that got overwritten by a big X. Sorry about that. Uh, the science collaboration members um, are, are um, available to become new friends of people that are new to Rubin and are entering Rubin through the DP0, the opportunity of the DP0. Um, so these people, this is just a facilitated partnerships so that people that are new to Rubin and the Rubin ecosystem can have a point of reference from somebody who having been in the science collaboration for a while, understands how the science collaborations work and can also point new uh, people new to Rubin to the best people inside of the Rubin project to answer their questions. Um, we hope that this will develop into um, collaborations as well. So we will facilitate the partnering of newcomers with experienced science collaboration members um, by trying to match you on a scientific and interest basis. And the program is facilitated uh, by the community engagement team. Next slide. I want to highlight that, as I mentioned, we do fundraise for our team, we fundraise for Rubin science, LSST science in general, and we have new and exciting opportunities. Uh, we will announce um, at the plenary on Wednesday um, a new uh, program that is sponsored by the Heisen Simons Foundation, um, a small grants program for members of three of the eight science collaborations, um, and also that should enable partnering with, um, with people from minority serving institutes and institutes that are uh, enjoying lesser resources for cutting edge science so as to level the playing field and enable really moving to, um, to be accessible to everybody, Rubin science to be accessible to everybody. And I think that is more or less all I thought that I would tell you. Uh, please do come to the plenary on Wednesday morning. Uh, you will hear from uh, me about uh, in some more detail about some of these programs. You will also hear from the chairs of or representative of each one of the eight science collaboration, what each science collaboration is doing and what they're focusing on. Awesome. Thank you very much, Fed. Uh, now we have our, our final pause for questions. Um, as always in the Zoom chat or via Slack. And while we're doing our final question period, I'll just pop up this final slide with a lot of resources on how to get more involved, um, how to join a science collaboration, how to use the forum, all that kind of stuff. So let's do some questions. And if you don't want to ask a question publicly, you can feel absolutely free just to Zoom chat just to me, and I will read your, your question out. So wait, how you can do it confidentially. Jim, do you have your hand up? Well, Christoph asked something that I don't, I don't think we have, but I don't know. Is there a, a follow-up project community email list on a something like a new mailman server? There, the email list that I most commonly use is a science mailing list, which you can get to if you go to um, lsst.org slash for scientists, which I don't think I have the link to. Oh, yes, here it is. Rubin Observatory for Scientists webpage. Uh, if you go there, you'll find um, over in the corner, there's a little box to join the science mailing list. And that's the mailing list we use for um, all like science opportunities and announcements um, go out that way. So uh, you can go there and use that. 
Rand Paul, do you want to add anything? I would say that's the main one to join. It's um, It's got a few thousand people on it. Um, otherwise, you know, to make sure that you're not missing things, uh, the announce everyone Slack channel over on the main Slack that we have um, for the Rubin Observatory, the, the corporation one. I don't know, Christoph, if you have access to that. Um, the digest is another self-subscribe um, list that you get on, and then you would get the digest, which I mentioned comes out every two weeks. So. I think there's various places that you can go to for information to make sure that you don't miss anything. But as for email lists, um, the science one and the digest one is what I would recommend. And usually anything, anything that goes out in any email list is also always posted in the community forum. So just dropping in on the news category, for example, which is what I'm showing you here. All the, the news digests will always be here. Announcements of opportunities will always be either in news or they'll be posted um, in the science category if they're science specific. So um, that's options for you as well, in addition to joining the mail lists. And then joining the science collaborations is the other best way to keep involved because they will um, spread out the information to their members um, via their own emailing lists as well. Well, it looks like we have some Zoom questions. Are the slides being saved anywhere? Yes, the slides are already on the section webpage. So in the, um, in the project and community workshop page, if you go um, to agenda like I'm doing here, and there's a, there's a web page for every individual session. And in that web page for the individual session, you got like the abstract and stuff, but then any slides that we use will be posted down here as well. So you can get those slides now. Um, a question I think for Fed, will collaborations incorporate other disciplines such as international law of outer space? Uh, fascinating question. Um, so let me answer indirectly. Uh, there is a process to the science collaboration are fairly diverse already in the scope so there's a lot of space for joining the science collaboration on the basis of the existing science collaboration on the basis of your science interest some of them um, in fact most of them have subgroups or working groups that are more specific and those um, groups and subgroups are definitely in flux um, so if you find like-minded people that are interested in a specific topic within uh, the broad range of topics that might be relevant to a science collaboration um, certainly that is um, that is that happens regularly that groups will be formed uh, the specific suggestion that you make the international law of outer space group that's fascinating um i don't think it would necessarily fit into any specific um science collaboration um in as far as i understand what it might what the scope of it might be if not perhaps sort of system if it's talking about um sort of system colonization but um Either way, there is definitely space for creating new science collaborations and there is a detailed process um, um, that has been formalized recently. Um, there is a decent process for doing so, so that is also a possibility. Uh, I'm not sure I really got the question, right? So I'm happy to try and answer it better if, you, if, it, if I can. Yeah, and follow-ups and clarifications in the Zoom chat are good too. And just sort of related maybe to international law of outer space, I just wanted to point out there's a Rubin and Satellite Constellation session on Wednesday in the last slot. So you might be interested in that as well. And just for the record, the Science Collaboration have a history of participation from people that are very involved in space ethics. Um, in space ethics um, um, topics. For example, Lucian Walkerways was the former um, coordinator of the science collaboration. She's the founder of a space ethics um, organization.
we'll just hang out and see if any more questions arise. Lots of time, so. Uh... And I also put it in the chat. If you think of questions during PCW or even after, you know, Slack DM us as well. Direct message, Sorry. not data management. Sorry, stay, say again, Steve, I accidentally interrupted. Oh, I was, no, sorry, I was saying, feel free to give a direct message us in Slack. DM meaning direct message, not data management. It's too many acronyms. Yeah, yeah, I have a, another question about Slack has come to me as well for people who are unfamiliar um, with Slack and the Slack channels. Um, yeah, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a little, a very brief show of, um, to navigate in Slack and find the different channels. So here is here is our Slack. Um, you can see I'm I'm a I'm a member of many many channels. These are all channels in Slack. Anything that starts with a hashtag is a channel in Slack. Um, and here this is our channel for this particular session. Every session has um, a channel as well as some additional um, fun channels like the Coffee Break channel is down here in our Ruben 2021 PCW Slack space. Um, but you are not automatically um, joined to every single Slack channel that we have. So if you're interested in a session and then you need to find the channel for that session, you see up here, let me make this bigger, where it says channels, a little plus sign will appear. Um, and you can browse the channels. So for example, if you are interested in attending the bro broker session later. You can search for channels with brokers and be like, oh, that's the slot later today about alert brokers that I wanted to attend. I should join that channel so that I can use it during the session. So you would click on that. If you weren't already in it, there'd be a little box that says join the channel. And then you could join the Slack channel like that. Um, so that's a little, little intro of how to use um, Slack. In addition to all the channels, you can direct message people down here and you can search for their names in the same way. So when I come here and I want to ask Steve a whole bunch of camera questions, I don't find him. <laughs> and Steve, did you do it in the Slack? I did, I'm on it right now. Hmm. I, um... Here, I don't see you. See how easy Slack is? <laughs> see how great it works? <laughs> okay, so yeah, I had a telescope question instead that I wanted to message Sandrine about and I could do that. Um, yeah, so that's there. You can find him if you type S rates. Ah. Found you, okay. <laughs> I, I find that Sometimes I type directly the last name because people are likely to include the full last name. So maybe if you type Fritz, you would have. Nope, I'm wrong. Never mind. Yeah, usually this uh, works a little better. That is, that is so weird. I did not know that. I can change my name if you like. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't set yourself oh. up when you join the first time, um, it just takes the, the first bit of your email address, I think. and. That's it is right. going to be hard to find people. Yes. Uh, Melissa, can I point out that I saw that this particular Slack allows you to put your pro your preferred pronouns, and that's always a great idea, um, especially normalizing the use of pronouns is definitely encouraged. So, and this particular Slack allows you to put your own pronoun in your profile, another picture, and all other fun things. Here we go. Pronouns added. I hadn't done it yet. So that was a good reminder. Any other questions come up in the Slack now that we showed people how to get there? Okay, in that case, I want to thank all the speakers, Fed, Lauren, Steve, Sandrine, Rand Paul, Jim, thanks for co-chairing with me. And thanks to everyone for being here. Enjoy the rest of the PCW. I'm going to hang out here in case there's any, like some final last minute questions, but otherwise have a great coffee break. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. for organizing. Thank you. Thank you.